on August 5th, 1945, in the sixth year of the Second World War, Arm destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima. It's stone etched by heat, which reached thousands of degrees, a monument recorded the passage of the blast. And burned into the pavement was the silhouette of one of the many who perished on that fateful day. Throughout the world, the reaction of press and public to the advent of atomic power was prompt and varied. Well, what did you think of that bomb we dropped on the Japs, Mrs. Glenn? Oh, isn't it terrible, all those people killed? I don't understand it. Well, it's a great triumph for our American industrial know-how. Science has overstepped the bow producing this diabolical weapon. The public, baffled by talk of protons, neutrons, isotopes, and isobars, flock to atomic exhibits in search of understanding. At such exhibits, the average person was able to learn such basic facts as that the atom is submicroscopic in size, and that the forces which hold it together are the same as those which keep the universe in balance. Around the particles which form the nucleus of the atom, other electrically charged particles called electrons constantly revolve like planets around the sun. It is within the nucleus itself that the cosmic energy is locked. To release this energy, laboratory machines generating millions of volts bombard the nucleus of the atom with particles, usually neutrons, driven at enormous speed. If the voltage generated is not sufficiently powerful, the particles are deflected. But as the voltage is raised to the proper amount, the particles reach the speed at which they are able to split the nucleus. It is the sum total of millions of such releases of energy that make up this new source of power. But that this type of power will soon become available to the average citizen is disclaimed by scientists like Harvard's James B. Conant and leading industrial physicists. That is, I take it, Professor Wheeler, you feel this question of trying to beat the radiation by shielding is just one of those problems that no matter how much research you did on it, looks insoluble. Is that right? The fundamental principles of the process just simply limit us on what we can do. Well, therefore, that looks then, I take it everybody's agreed that the use of this power for automobiles and planes seems to be out of the question for technical reasons. The key to the atom's secrets was first given to the world in 1905, when the genius Albert Einstein defined the relation between all matter and energy and evolved his revolutionary theory of special relativity. Then, in 1919, Lord Rutherford confirmed Einstein's theory by smashing the nitrogen atom. By 1934, Italy's Enrico Fermi and Francis Frederick Joliot had made substantial progress. Meanwhile, in America, scientists like Arthur H. Compton, Harold C. Urey, and Ernest O. Lawrence were carrying on intensive research. In 1939, Lisa Meitner, exiled from Germany, computed the results which could be obtained from splitting uranium. In January of the same year, at George Washington University, whose staff had long been alert to developments in atomic research, scientists from several nations gathered for a routine conference, heard a report of startling significance. Word has just come through from Germany by way of Denmark that the German physicists Hahn and Strassmann have just verified that the uranium atom under neutron bombardment actually splits into two parts. To the scientists, this dramatic news brought a great sense of urgency. Summoning his assistant, Dr. Merle A. Tuve of the Carnegie Institution went at once to his laboratory. Simultaneously with scientists at Columbia, California, and Johns Hopkins, 
Tuve and his colleagues succeeded within 48 hours in checking the reported findings of the German physicist. Kill the lights. No longer any doubt about it. That uranium is splitting into at least two big parts. Those biggest kicks are nearly 100 million electron volts. The results verified. Columbia University's Dr. George B. Pegram called these developments to the attention of the Navy Department in Washington. Yes, yes, we'll be uh, very glad to explain to your people just what the military possibilities of this uranium fission may prove to be. But to the Navy Department, these laboratory experiments seem to be of no immediate importance. Very interesting, Doctor. Keep us informed. Dr. Pegram concentrated on research at Columbia University. Working under his supervision were Dr. Leo Szilard and Dr. Fermi, who were laying the groundwork for a chain reaction in uranium. Encouraged by their successful progress, Szilard discussed with Dr. Einstein in the summer of 1939 the results of their findings and stressed the urgent need for action by the U.S. government. Conscious of the disaster which would inevitably follow if Nazi Germany should be the first to succeed in releasing atomic energy, Dr. Einstein decided to write a personal letter to the president. Within a few days, the historic Einstein letter was taken to Washington by a New York economist, Alexander Sachs who, through close acquaintance with Mr. Roosevelt's advisors, had easy access to the White House. The letter was immediately brought to the attention of the President. Recognizing the critical significance of Einstein's message, President Roosevelt signed an order appointing the director of the National Bureau of Standards, Dr. Lyman J. Briggs, as chairman of a special advisory committee on uranium. After only one meeting, the committee was able to report that an atomic bomb was a definite possibility. By the following year, the entire U.S. program of uranium research had been placed under the supervision of Dr. Vannevar Bush, able director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. In December 1941, with the United States at war, Dr. Pegram returned from a fact-finding trip to England and reported his findings to Dr. Bush. The Germans are certainly working on an atomic bomb. As Harold Urey told you, we learned that they have been receiving the whole output of the big Norwegian heavy water plant. They couldn't have been using it for anything else. What was your impression of British progress? Chadwick and the other physicists agree entirely with us that given pure uranium-235, we can make a bomb that will work. They are also confident that it will be practicable to obtain the uranium-235. But they realize that it will run into a big industrial job. England is overtaxed at the present time, and the British are all in favor of having a job done on this side of the water. Well, we're now all fighting the same war. I'm going to see the president tomorrow. I'm sure that he will agree that the job has got to be done and that we'll get the support that we need. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. With presidential backing for an all-out research program, contracts were let to a dozen laboratories for exhaustive study of every method of any hope of success. In September 1942, on recommendation of Dr. Bush, the U.S. Army engineers' newly created Manhattan District, under Major General Leslie R. Groves, was assigned the task of expanding the laboratory experiments into huge industrial projects. Meanwhile, at the University of Chicago, in a secret laboratory set up within the walls of the stadium's squash courts, a dangerous and partly unpredictable experiment was undertaken. Dr. Fermi and his assistants after months of arduous preparation, achieved the first controlled chain reaction in uranium fission. The 
way was now cleared for the practical application of atomic power to the nation's war effort. At Oak Ridge, Tennessee, at Hanford, Washington, and at Los Alamos, New Mexico, mammoth plants were built for the productionable materials and atomic bombs. To staff these establishments, thousands of able young scientists and technicians were called into service. Yes, that's O-A-K, Oak Ridge. All right, I'll be there. Virtually isolated from the outside world, new communities sprang up almost overnight as top priority materials and manpower were made available for the secret project. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with 75,000 people, quickly became the fifth largest city in the state. Mobilized to carry out the most formidable engineering job in history were thousands of the nation's industrial firms of every size and type. To keep the most closely guarded secret of the war, technicians and even scientists were strictly limited to knowledge of the specific tasks to which they were assigned. Working on seemingly unrelated jobs, Many employees were not even sure producing anything. And few workers had any conception of the fabulous costs involved. Here it is, General Groves, plutonium. Well, that's uh, the first time I've seen it, but if you don't mind, I wish you'd hold that under it, because after all, there's uh, about $50 million uh, in that test. Finally, after three years' work and an expenditure of $2 billion, the atomic experts were ready to test their first bomb. Before dawn on July 16, 1945, at the Alamogordo Army Air Base in New Mexico, a small band of military and civilian technicians waited nervously. Two minutes to go. Stretched out on the sand, tensely expectant, were General Groves, Dr. Bush, and Dr. Conant. In the control shack was Dr. J. Oppenheimer, who, assisted by Dr. I. Rabi and others, had directed the making of the bomb itself. The automatic control's got it now. Rob, this time the stakes are really high. It's going to work all right, Robert, and I'm sure we'll never be sorry for it. Well, in 40 seconds, we'll know. Minus 30 seconds. Minus 20 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Minus 5 seconds. means of publicity, U.S. scientists are seeking to arouse Americans to a realization that humanity cannot survive misuse of atomic power. From Princeton, New Jersey, the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, headed by Dr. Einstein, has issued an urgent appeal for funds with which to educate the public. Uh, we scientists who released this immense power have overwhelming responsibility in this world life and death struggle to harness atom. We ask your help in this fateful moment as sign that we scientists do not stand alone. 
I agree. The common aim of scientists today is to bring home to the public a realization of the magnitude of an atomic bomb explosion. And the fact that this sudden destruction can be delivered anywhere on Earth by a single plane. That a bomb could be brought into a seaport by a ship and detonated by radio. Cognizant of the potential threat to humanity and the unrestricted use of atomic power, Dr. Bush and Dr. Conant accepted appointments to a State Department committee, headed by Under Secretary Dean Acheson. Out of the work of this group and David E. Lilienthal's board of consultants came the report upon which was based the U.S. plan for international control, which Bernard Baruch proposed to the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. The American position, as expressed by Baruch and his advisors, has received overwhelming support from a majority of the nations. The search of science for the absolute weapon has reached fruition in this country. But we stand ready to destroy this instrument, to lift it from death to life, if the world will join in an effective and working system. Let us not deceive ourselves. We must elect world peace or world destruction. Today, the whole world fears the ultimate devastation which a war of atomic weapons could bring. And the United States is prepared to cooperate fully in eliminating, by world agreement and for all time, the nightmare of atomic war.